Welcome back to Watchbox Studios and Watches tonight, guys. We talk embarrassingly bad watch listings, why Rolex prices are fair, what I think of the new Breitling Premier line, and what you think of it, why despite fair Rolex pricing, you should nevertheless ditch big brands and check brands beyond the pale, and of course the cream of the GPHG crop as well as the worst snubs of 2018. All of this and your wrist shots and a giveaway tonight on Watches Tonight. All right, I want to emphasize there is no better place than the watchbox.com to buy, sell, or trade luxury watches. 2,000 pre-owned and vintage luxury watches live 24 hours a day and globally. It's where I do quite literally buy my watches and I'm willing to pay you for it. We are picking a winner of our October giveaway watch, the Seiko Astron GPS Solar, radio receiver always on point, sports watch for all seasons. Fall will be your first and we are giving it away at the end of this broadcast, so you have to stay with me. Jumping into batting practice, warming up with your pitches and my cuts the world series may be over but the baseball metaphors continue time to run where we call bs on the web's worst watch sales listings today we have a bit of a rolex daytona disaster or at least i should say a det daytona disaster on the installment plan because it comes in several tranches now this is true. Evidently promising a Rolex Daytona is the going out of business sale of online watch dealer gimmicks. To be sure, stuffing a title to grab internet search traffic is par for the course in the world's wide web. That said, you should at least deliver the goods you've promised. This Bell & Ross seller did not get the memo. Despite the DC Marvel crossover level sensation suggested by this sausage casing of a listing description, there's neither Rolex Daytona nor Omega Speedmaster to be seen in this mishmash of promised brands. I have no immediate doubt that this is a real Bell & Ross, but given the bad faith tactics, I cannot take the seller seriously or trust it. And we have two more from Japan. Now, something may be lost in translation, but Rolex is Rolex, and, well, frankly, Daytona is Daytona. So, we have the legendary fluted bezel Daytona just, or at least that's how it's being sold. But at least that might be a real Rolex wristwatch. This one, not so much. This might be the earliest known Daytona. In fact, the earliest known Daytona of any kind. Take that double Swiss underline 6239 and a limited edition too, according to the listing. That's as bad as it gets, guys, but at least they give you a display case back. Now, when is your Rolex Daytona not a Rolex Daytona? When it is an Armand Nicolet, that is when. In fact, Army Nick is the innocent party here, and this listing is just an absolute mess. It's all down to the seller, not the brand. First, there's a bogus reference attached that's neither Rolex nor Armand Nicolet, and you can see if we go full screen right there. That's made up in the worst possible way, and despite an un-Rolex like display case back, explicitly stating 10 ATM or 100 meters, this Rolex Daytona Armand Nicolet dress watch is listed as a dive watch with a baffling 3,000 meter water resist or 3,000 foot water resistance claim. Impressive, but I think someone missed a decimal right there. Seller, well, sketchy seller, he doubles down in his description by promising a silver oyster bracelet and frankly, does this Armand Nicolet Rolex Daytona look like it's on an oyster bracelet. Come on, guys. Keep it keep it reasonable. A at least sort of tell the truth. How can you trust the person to sell you a $6,000 watch when they can't get stuff that basic right? I'm laughing, but I'm also crying inside. All right. Fortunately, we can always count on Chrono24 to sort the worst listings from the web and protect us from these kind of sketchiest sellers, right? Well, Chrono will protect us. Oh, you gotta be kidding me. Chrono! It's the same guy, and it's the same fake Rolex Daytona 11623. Is there any takeaway from this carnage? Well, you can't spell carnage without car. And I think I've just discovered a new sales tactic for used car salesmen. <laughs> Rolex Daytona, full power, automatic, actual miles. Don knows. Great album. By the way, help me name and shame, guys. The worst of the web. Send your candidates to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. Friends, join in from around the world. JP Melbs from Melbourne, Australia. Doc B, good day from California. I can see Cull Obsidian from the UK. Alexi Samola from Finland. I have uh, Svenvo from Bulgaria. Welcome, Eric Nielsen. Paul Friend from Edinburgh, Scotland. 
Edward Ledden from Sweden, joined by Jay Johnson from Atlanta, and Lester Watch Reviews from Greenwich, London. Jay Chapman is my hero here. He's getting up early to join me from Singapore, and Kevin W. from Sydney. Friends, do we have any folks from the Middle East joining us? Let me know. Jumping into our program for the night, I want to remind you that Blair P. asks a question often asked. So this is representative. Blair P. Hey Tim, a Rolex watch is overpriced. $9,000 for a sub, 12 and change for a Daytona, and eight grand for a dual time Explorer 2. All of the watches seem pretty basic. Is this gouging? Well, let's consider this. Blair, I respect your opinion, but I'm going to have to disagree strongly. And Rolex has offered extraordinary integrity in an industry that often, maybe usually, lacks it. So let's consider first that almost every steel Rolex sports watch is waitlisted right now. We have people using ridiculous terms like Rolex shortage, but you get the idea. Then consider that the aftermarket markup that we see applied to months old used steel ceramic Daytonas, often 100% markup. Sky Dwellers, the steel Sky Dweller, we often see more than 100% markup. Submariner Hulks, often marked up 50% above the $9,050 list. And the hottest of the moment, the new Pepsi GMT Master. This is a watch that retails for $9,250. We often see it at three times the price. So, that's an all-world model, that right there, with new tech. It's got the 70-hour power reserve, the Chrono G escapement, Liga etched escape wheel, huge R&D plus tooling costs, and it's well below 10 grand. And here's the thing, it's only $300 more than the previous generation steel black and blue GMT. That's Rolex keeping the faith. Consider Patek Philippe. This is important. This year, this spring, with the Nautilus raising the price 25% on a watch that's largely unchanged since 2006. In fact, you could even argue it's been degraded a bit with a mass-produced silicon hairspring rather than the old overcoil and pin sleeve removable links in the bracelet rather than screws. 25% more expensive this year. Now, Paddock probably could have gone 100% more expensive and it would have sold, but you see, that's not something that Rolex does. Respect for Paddock, but that's not something that Rolex does. I can't fault Patek for doing this, but Rolex would not have made that move. Now, here's two ways that Rolex is concretely keeping the faith with collectors. First, it respects past Rolex watch buyers, and it does this by not opening the floodgates of production even though it could. Knowing the market could absorb perhaps twice as many Daytonas, subs, and GMTs, Rolex holds the line, and that protects those who have already bought from depreciation and fallout. Second, Rolex respects future Rolex buyers by largely keeping the prices stable. Small changes between 7 and 10 percent every 18 to 24 months, but that's mostly keeping in line with inflation. The bottom line here is that Rolex largely holds the prices static so that if you are sitting in a wait list or if you're waiting to purchase, you're not going to wind up paying substantially more than another guy did six or eight months before to get the same watch. Here's what a normal brand would do if it were lucky enough to fall into Rolex's place. First, a normal watch brand would notice that its watches have developed dealer wait lists and aftermarket markups. Second, a normal watch brand would raise prices dramatically. Third, a normal watch brand would explosively increase production to make hay while the sun shines in this very cyclical industry. Fourth, a normal watch brand would completely destroy its brand equity, destroy its good name with collectors, and ultimately destroy its product resale value. Rolex does none of the above. Rolex keeps its older models relatively price stable, never designs new models with the idea of creating planned obsolescence of the old, and regularly updates its existing lines with upgrades within generation and new generations on a regular basis. Remember, back during the 2000s and from about 2010 to 2015, all brands were price gouging, boosting production, overproducing, and hurting themselves. Rolex was not. Maybe that's why Rolex didn't suffer. Chan H asks, do you like the new Breitling Premier Collection? Guys, oh, Ordinary 999, Tim Daytona, 116500 LN, black or white dial? Black. I, I just think it's more coherent. I love the expansion of the dial into the bezel seamlessly. Jumping back to our topic du jour, Chan H. Tim, do you like the new Bre Breitling Premier Collection? Guys, sound off in the box. Let me know if you like the new Breitling Premier Collection, and I'll read your comments. 
Hi Chen, yes I do. In fact, the Green Dial Premier 01 Bentley is one of the hottest chronographs of the year from where I stand. I love the tone on tone black on a sunburst green with matching strap. I also have to say it completely resurrects the viability of the Breitling for Bentley concept. This is no longer dead to me thanks to this model. And I love that cambered sapphire. In profile, it gets even better. The vintage Premier look is studied and faithful. Georges Kern teased this early in the year and he stayed true to his word. The Premier Automatic 40 without date. Further, keep in the faith, Georges Kern said he would have watches that were similar in design, in size, and where the original featured no date, neither would the new watch, so promise kept. The day date is a bit anodyne, but then again, no collection is uniformly strong. It's not a bad offering, it's just a little bit sterile. Finally, these premieres look great, not ambitious, but a triumph for Georges Kern and kind of the silent hero of the Breitling revival. Uh, a man named Guy Beauvais, he's the product development director who's really behind the actual design and execution of these models. Georges Kern is kind of the spiritual and direction father, but uh, Guy Beauvais is the man who's actually making these watches. He's not setting the course, he's executing the plan. And I have to wonder, and, and this is where the conspiracy theorist in me starts to run rampant, but about the Navitimer 8 collection that bowed back in February. Now I said at the time, this feels like half an idea, not a complete idea, not something that was a, that was birthed into the world as a fully thought out notion. I often suspected that this was a project that Georges Kern inherited about halfway finished from the old Schneider family ownership. He did his best to reconfigure it to represent his personal tastes and values and what he thought the new Breitling should be, but for the most part this was what he had on hand. It's impossible in this industry where you have two, three, four year lead times to develop new collections for a person with a few months of lead time to create not one watch, but multiple. So I think this is a fusion of the old Schneider family vision and Georges Kern. He said at the time, wait till October and the new premieres. And I didn't want to steal his thunder. That was his news to break. But I really feel that the premier line is the first of the Georges Kern Breitlings that made it from thought to execution from his head to your wrist. And therefore, I continue to believe that this was somewhat finished when he arrived. Now jumping into our live chat box, I can see our friends joining in. Uh, Jumbo Jet Pilot saying, good to see Breitling moving in the right direction. Go the way of Gio and Alango Unzona over the past 20-ish years. Marco saying Breitling needed to shake things up. They were getting stale. But Sean M saying Breitling underwhelms me in general. JB Melp saying, I like the new Premier Bentleys or Breitlings, including the Bentley, but I don't understand why they offer it with both the B01 in-house caliber and the 7750 for the same reason they did with the Navitimer 8s price. You have to have a collection, and a collection has to have a staircase of pricing. Jumping into our next topic, oh, this is a great one. Danny M, seasonal, and one of my favorites because it involves the color orange and orange watches. Danny M asking, Tim, can you recommend some Halloween-themed watches that will be wearable all year long? Here's the thing about Halloween-themed watches. They need to be expressive. They need to be exuberant. They need to have a costume caricature quality. And often, they need to have some sort of overt orange factor. But in order for your luxury investment to not turn into a pumpkin on November 1st, we need something you can wear all day long. Therefore, I say our price point for entry's sake, we're gonna forget about the monster from Shinola for now, but we're gonna go with the Doxa Sub 1200T. A true to history recreation of one of the watches that made Doxa famous. It harks back to 1969 and the arrival of the first Doxa Helium escape valve. This is a watch that is big, butch, but not too big and too butch. 42 millimeters in diameter and surprisingly thin, it has a mechanical masterpiece of a bezel, which is so relentlessly mechanical, you're gonna fall in love with the component, not just the watch. For the first time, you're going to fall in love with a piece of a watch. Late 60s, early 70s style, beads of rice bracelet, and a real ETA on the inside. You can wear this one with pride and be true to history all year long. 1890 US dollars. Jumping up, a couple of echelons of pricing, $8,200 Rolex Milgauss GV Z Blue. Okay, guys, you're going to need a little bit of a 
panache, a raffish sensibility, you're going to have to be able to pull off this watch, but not just for Halloween. This is the kind of watch a confident man with a little bit of an extroverted style and maybe a little bit of a sense of humor about himself will wear all year long. So while it's an excellent Halloween watch with its outlandish statement and its panoply of colors, nevertheless, this is one to wear all year long, and the Milgauss easily fits underneath the cuff. So not just all year long, but in all situations, all year long. Finally, we're going HH, Haute Horlogerie, Grunefeld, with the 1941 Principia Automatic. This is Grunefeld of the Netherlands and the Horological Brothers, Tim and Bart, making their first automatic watch. 39.5 millimeters with a movement to match. It's about 30,000 euros, adjusted in six positions, 56 hour power reserve, excruciatingly hand finished bridges and plates in stainless steel. You can see the unique ridge beveling that they use on their bridges. There's actually a blasted interior and then there's a raised ridge. These guys, in their spare time, do finishing for Audemars Piguet, Renault et Papy. So your RM53 Pablo McDonough may have gone through their atelier. For $30,000, we'll go back to that picture of the 1941 Principia Auto. They call this dial Salmon. I call it Great Pumpkin. You be the judge, but this is one you can wear with pride and have a one-on-one -on -one first name relationship with your watchmakers. I once wondered what their name pronunciation was during fondue in Switzerland, and one of the guys with me had the Grunefelds on speed dial, called them up, and the voicemail came back, Grunefeld. That's how cool these guys are. So I recommend that as your ultimate Halloween watch 2018. Albert B. asks, Tim, is there a reason I should look past mainstream brands? It seems like the safe value, service arrangements, dealer network availability, and product QC are simply safer bets with Breitling, Rolex, Omega, Tag, that type. Okay, I just told you why Rolex pricing is super fair, and now I'm going to tell you to look elsewhere. Because if you go outside the realm, beyond the pale... Think outside the box of the big brand, Impressive Horizons Expand. I've done it, and I think you should. Remember, guys, I'm wearing a Zin on my wrist. Most folks think the watch is pronounced Sin, and they ask me what G-Shock this is. So, I've done it, and I think you should, but let me define what a big brand is. I'm going with 50,000 units annual production, and that's entirely arbitrary, but it does let us name names. So group ownership is okay on conditions, but 50,000 is going to keep brands as large as Ulysse Nardin, roughly 25,000, Blancpain, roughly 10,000, Langa, roughly 5,000, and Zenith, 20 to 25,000 in play. But it cuts out the mainstream three, Rolex, Breitling, and... Omega, as well as Tag Heuer, and larger group staples like IWC, JLC, and Panerai, which are really like smaller versions of big brands in production, marketing, and boutique networks than they are big versions of small brands. They're like little big brands rather than big small brands, if you get what I'm saying. So now, why would you want to go with smaller brands? Let's talk about small brands like Damasco, smaller brands like Langa, smaller brands like... I mean, one might even say Doxa. Well, because there's no stigma, there's no marker, there's no flag and unwanted attention. For better or worse, a Rolex makes you visible. This can lead to situations that range from uncomfortable to unsafe. Depending on where you live in the world and your appetite for attention, you might desire a watch that lets you fly under the radar. So, a Longines or a Mula Glasuta is not going to draw the same amount of attention as a steel ceramic Daytona. I should also mention, related, it's not an automatic invitation when you wear a smaller brand watch for others to guess your wealth. So, when they guess how much you're worth because they see you're wearing a Vacheron Constantin or a Patek Philippe, which are right in the 40,000 to 50,000 production range. Uh, when people start asking you whether your watch is a real dot, 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 when people start cluelessly trying to explain to you why you spent $50,000 on something that's nonsensical because a Casio is more accurate or smart watches are the future, you don't have to deal with that as much with the smaller brands. And there's the fraternity of collectors. Not only do smaller brands often have more dedicated enthusiast communities, but these folks, not the gawkers, but the true believers, are often going to be willing to act as your guide to the brand, your sensei, your guru for a smaller brand, so to speak. So you're coming into a community of enthusiasts that can often help to improve your enjoyment of the watch you bought. 
And then there's the joy of discovery. Often the chance to discover a hitherto unknown brand uh, can help you learn its story, its products, its philosophy, its people, and fall in love with it. It will enhance your enjoyment with your smaller brand watch. I also tell folks that lasting satisfaction in the watch space comes from turning a purchase, which is a one-time thing and materialistic, into an experience which generally involves a journey of discovery and other people. A smaller brand watch, as well as the community that often flourishes around smaller brands, can really be your guide and your roadmap to creating that journey from purchase to experience. Jumping in. Viewer wrist shots. Okay. Uh, right here I can see Eric Nielsen saying, don't forget Fred Mandelbaum. That's right, watch Fred on Instagram, a very cool guy and a main input into the character of the revitalized and historically cognizant Breitling brand. A very cool dude, he's been making the rounds at the Breitling road shows. So, viewer wrist chats where I show your watches, your pixels, or I should say your pieces on my pixels. I own the pixels. Jim B. sends an inspired opener thanks to his 1969 Zenith A3637, a diver from 1969, and his Bianchi Milano, a bike from 1996. Bill P. offers a different set of Italian wheels with his Omega Speedmaster and his 1991 Lamborghini Diablo. First run Diablo, very cool. Anders P. presents a third way to... Roll Italiano and showcase your watch with his 1952 Rolex 6024 and his MV Augusta. I adore MV. Dan V of Milwaukee purchased his FP Journe Elegant 48, the most sophisticated quartz watch you can buy from Govberg. Dan, thank you for trusting our company. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com and see your watches through this window. Primary feature. Oh, by the way, we got some friends joining in. Xavier N. joining us from Manila, and Kratz M. joining us from, or Kratz M. joining us from Christmas City, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And I have a question from Monkey C. asking, is Long considered a small brand with 5,000 pieces a year and easy accessibility of brand representatives on a first name basis and an email basis? Absolutely. Longa is still very much a smaller brand. And then Moritz asking, Tim, could you make a video of independent watchmakers and their watches? Yeah, I could absolutely do that. We'll roll out a series in the future, possibly even a independent watch brand watches live on Watchbox Reviews on Tuesdays. Jumping in, greetings from Germany. Moritz F. joining us. Thank you so much for joining me from Germany and staying up late. Primary feature, it's that time of the year. GPHG 2018, the Grand Prix de Logerie de Genève, the Oscars of watchmaking. Faves, gripes, snubs at the Academy Awards of Watchmaking 2018. Each year since 2001, a group of esteemed judges, partly selected anew each year, has been selected by the Foundation GPHG to assess what is widely described as the Oscars of watchmaking, complete with red carpet and awards ceremony. The Schäufele family of Chopard. For example, in 2017, at the annual awards, last year's winner, the Chopard LUC Full Strike, was recognized with the Agi d'Or, or the Golden Needle, or the Golden Hand. That's basically what it means. It's the Golden Hand. It is equivalent to Best Picture at the Oscars. Now, I'm not going to cover each category because, frankly, there are too many of them, and only brands care who wins the Ladies' Complication Classification. Can we show the Ladies' Complication Classification one more time for those who have an inclination? There it is. You saw it. It's gone. It's back. It's gone. First, we're going to go with the sports watch category. I'm going to pick my winner from amongst the nominees, and it is the Seiko SLA 25. This is the Seiko Prospects 1968, that's it, upper right-hand corner, 1968 re-edition, a shockingly faithful and upscale tribute to the first high beat diver, not just Seiko's first, but the first high beat diver ever in 1968. This is literally a grand Seiko masquerading as a Seiko, complete with the $5,400 retail price, the Zeratsu tin plate manual optically smooth finishing on the monoblock case. It has a grand Seiko derived 5 hertz or 36,000 vibration 8L55 55 hour power reserve automatic caliber. And it's made in the grand Seiko Shizuku Ishii watch studio in Morioka, Japan. So it's it's literally made by Grand Seiko's staff 
for Seiko. All of this and 44.8 millimeters, 1500 pieces in a front loader case, which I adore because the whole block of the case is one piece and hand finished. So that is also true to history. And impressively, this is a saturation dive watch with no helium escape valve. They tell you you can use it in exotic oxygen and exotic gas mixtures, needs no helium escape valve, because of its seals, no helium can ingress, so none need egress. Now, who was snubbed? Rolex! I'm surprised that the, if we can go back to the the sports watch nominees real quick, but you can see that the Tudor Black Bay GMT, um, I mean, it, it was nominated in this collection of watches, and unfortunately, it's in the GPHG 2018, but Rolex is not. And here's the problem. Rolex's GMT is easily the best sports watch of the year at its price point, $9,250, and with the Pepsi GMT, Rolex nailed it. If we bring up the Pepsi GMT, 2018 Jeep Wrangler. That's what I think when I see this. When you take a legend, when you take something that's almost sacred, that's allowed to evolve, but never that much. It's hard to revise it enough for those who want change and respect history enough for those who want it to be static. So Rolex absolutely threaded the needle just as Jeep did with the Wrangler and they hit it out of the ballpark. New movement, new bezel, uh, new bracelet, all of this for a very fair price. There's a reason these are selling at three times list. It's red hot. It's tough to revitalize a legend and Rolex did it. And for only $300 more than the old BLNR. Rolex was not nominated. Somehow Tudor was. You can see the Black Bay GMT is in it this year. I can't believe the Pepsi GMT is not. Now jumping into men's watch. This is a catch-all category, but I'm going to pick one of the little guys, and this is from a class of mostly little guys. The only really big brand in there is Vacheron, but I'm going with the smallest brand on the page, the Acrivia Chronomet Contemporain. This is Recep Recepi's masterpiece. 38 millimeters, black or white Grand Faux enamel dial and a 100 hour movement to put F.P. Journe, Laurent Ferrier, and even Ludovic Ballard on notice. Hand finished, beautifully executed. This is from a guy who interned as a watchmaking apprentice at Patek when he was in his teens. From Kosovo, along with his brother, he's executed a masterpiece. Recep Recepi is the real deal. Get on board now. If you can imagine buying an F.P. Journe bespoke pocket watch back when that was still possible during the 1980s, this is like buying the wristwatch equivalent of that. He's going to be a watchmaker on par with the Laurent Ferrier, the Ludovic Ballard, the Cary Voudelainen, the Philippe Dufour, the F.P. Journe. So this is the watch to own if you want to be there at the inception of something great. I'll also say, snubbed, Nomos with the Autobahn. For 4800 US dollars, the Nomos Autobahn is the best men's watch that Frankly, not enough people talked about and the GPHG overlooked entirely. So a striking watch designed with imagination by Werner Eislinger and his crew. There are three versions, which you can see right there, of which the blue granular dial with its ditch, dished bowl-like profile is easily the looker and the one to own. 41 millimeters automatic winding with a new in-house caliber spectacular loom. 100 meters water resistance so you can wear it anytime, anywhere. This is the watch that should be up for the men's prize against the Acrivia, and it's a value play. By the way, if I were to nominate a runner-up snub, it would be the Saxonia Copper Blue from Longa. That should be in there. Chronograph. I could see right here Mike K is saying, sorry, Tim, don't mess with Jorn, especially the CB. Do me a favor. I'm going to give full credit to the CB, but you got to look up the Acrivia Chronomet Contemporain. This is a watch that will impress. It is easily on par with the Chronomet Blue, and on, from a finishing standpoint, I've examined both of them, Recep Recep is a little bit above what Jorn's doing. Jumping in, Watch Lounge, joining us right now. And Doc B saying, wow, from intern to crafting that, well done. Indeed, get on board now. Chronograph, everyone's favorite complication. Some would say the king of complications, Mont Blanc takes it. The Mont Blanc Mono Pusher Chronograph. There were two chronographs at SIHH 2018 that had journalists giddy with joy and covetous with desire. And this was one of them. The Mont Blanc finally combining the revered Mont Blanc Minerva calibers, finished Patek Philippe style to Patek Philippe standards, but now in a wearable size, no more 50 and 47 millimeter chronographs 
out of Minerva. This is 40 millimeters in steel, a base metal, and that green dial chrono sets hearts a flutter. If we could go back to the Mont Blanc dial right here with cathedral style semi aviation theme. I love this one, and you're paying for the watchmaking in steel, not for precious metal this time. Perfect fit, an eminently reasonable price of about 30,000 US dollars, and they're only making a hundred of them. This is another case where they could easily have sold two or three times as many at list price. We got one, we sold it, it was gone, I never even got to film a video. Snubbed, well, the other watch that had everyone going crazy at SIHH 2018, the other chronograph was the Longa Triple Split monstrous and mechanically masterful. This is as much a work of art as anything on the program tonight, including the Acrivia. And I have to say, it's only about a half a millimeter thicker than the double split. You can split seconds, minutes, and hours with this monster. They're launching it in white gold in 100 pieces. That will not be the end of it, but what a way to start. That thing got snubbed. Jumping in, I can see Matt Foster saying, Mont Blanc AD called me last week and offered me one of these. And he said, I asked to see it, so hey, let me know. Matt, wh what do you think? When you get it, let me know. Mike K, Tim, how do you clean your watches? I clean my watches, well, first of all, now with the Zinn, things were a little bit different. I can clean it with a toothbrush and not a soft one either. Generally, I would clean my watches with a dry polishing cloth, and then I would usually use some sort of a silicone polish on gold watches to clean them and finish them. I also like to use wooden toothpicks stuck into a piece of silk for detail work. Jumping straight back, uh, I see Sunny N is saying, I think Mont Blanc will surprise a few years down the road. I do. I, I agree with that. I think Mont Blanc has a lot of legs to run. And Naresh P, greetings, Tim, joining us. No problem. We love our late friends just as much. Chronometry, David Kando. Here we are, arguably the most accomplished young watchmaker in the GPHG field. Recep Recep may get there. He's not there yet. David Kendo is an AHCI candidate, so he may join the likes of the Dufours, the Voudelainens, and the FP Journe. And he spent the last couple of years designing mega mech grand sonneries, repeaters, and tourbillon calibers. He's the man beyond the insane curved tourbillon caliber of the Baudelet Ivresse. If you've ever seen this watch, it actually features beveled conical wheels, the Baudelet Ivresse. A watch, I don't even know if they mass produced it, but what a, what a dream. Uh, but but this is what he's launching this year, the half, well, there's the movement of the bottle right there. Let's jump right back to David Kando and his new Half Hunter. A titanium watch, a titanium movement, a canted tourbillon, a disappearing spring-loaded crown for adjusting all of it, and it's only 12 and a half millimeters thick in spite of appearances. This is a man who made grand comps for JLC, now striking out on his own and about to be elevated to the ranks of the greatest watchmakers in the business. He deserves to win chronometry. Snubbed the Charles Frodsham double impulse chronometer. Charles Frodsham, a British company since 1834, mostly carriage clocks. They have a royal warrant, supplier to the royal family, but they're only making six to 12 of these a year. And it incorporates watchmaking ideas from both Derek Pratt and George Daniels, late both of them regrettably. Own a Daniels double direct escapement and in chronometer grade timing trim. There's an image of what you get in this watch. A fearsomely complex project spanning decades, the double impulse chronometer is entirely a product of England and the first wristwatch from Frodsham. Short of a Roger W. Smith, this is as close as you can get to a modern day George Daniels and for that matter, a Derek Pratt. Mechanical exception, the UN Freak Vision. Automatic winding, 50 hour power reserve, silicon wheels, silicon escapement, silicon constant force anchor escapement device, silicon balance wheel, the first automatic winding freak. I chose this as my best of show SIHH 2018, and there is no way this shouldn't win mechanical exception this year. Snubbed, the IWC tribute to Paul Weber. That's right. The quarter price stainless steel Zeitwerk that everyone was talking about, this certainly seems to be the watch that should have received a nomination and probably should have taken mechanical exception even in the presence of the UN. 60 hour power reserve, it one-ups the 36 of the Zeitwerk and IWC took it to Longa with real world durability, a 10 layer hand finished lacquer dial and even 500 pieces in steel. They didn't come anywhere near satisfying demand for this watch. Further, IWC had the courage to embrace an obscure part of their history in the late 19th century with their pocket watches based on the Paul Weber patents, and they had the courage to make it outside any of their modern lines. 
It's not a Portuguese. It's not a Portofino. It's a standalone. It's a one year. It's a very special watch. And it's one of the few modern IWCs that I will call a no joke, no doubt investment piece. Finally, Challenge, a class for sub $4,000 watches. The Reservoir Long Bridge British Racing. There it is right there, guys. It is a power reserve. It is a retrograde minute. It is a jump hour. It is 39 millimeters in stainless steel, a French brand paying tribute to British motor racing in the first half of the 20th century, building their watches in Switzerland, and for about 3,800 US dollars, that's a hell of a lot of complication. A real ETA 2824 base, not a Salida, and their own custom complication module on top. For $3,800, give me that all day long. I was thrilled when I saw the debut of this retrograde and jump hour themed brand in October of 2017. They have done nothing to dissuade me of my enthusiasm. If Richard Mille is a racing machine for the wrist, this is like part of a racing machine, the speedometer for your wrist. Snubbed, the Baum & Mercier Clifton Baumatic Chronometer. For $2,990, this was my pick for sub $5,000 watch of SIHH and sub $5,000 watch of the year, even including the Nomos, because, well, frankly, this was the only sub $5,000 watch at SIHH. Five day power reserve, chronometer certification, display case back, silicon hairspring, silicon escapement, and a four to five year maintenance interval publicly declared by Baum and Mercier because they said it's absurd to pay $2,900 for a watch and then $500 for a service every two years. I can get behind this heart and soul. I will say this, it's even sharper in the black dial. Jumping right in guys, before we leave this topic, let me let out one gripe. There are too many awards. There are now 17 categories. And this is getting dangerously close to the actual Oscars with their 24 categories. In 2001, the first edition of this thing had all of seven big prizes. Let's move back in that direction. Jumping into viewer wrist shots. Guys, you spoiled me. I had to pick from among the shots tonight. I'll try to get everyone in, but let's lead off our second stage with Andrew W. Andrew W. was trackside with his Rolex GMT. Nice to see him at Austin, the Grand Prix of US, Kimi's latest and possibly last victory, watching the Iceman win with his 16710. George S. Oris Aquis Date and the anti-hero of choice conquering the workday at the office. Casper joins the fun with a composed Rolex shot worthy of Mr. Porter artfully arranged and superb choice of watch. Tim M. Hey, that's me! Rocks with the Blue Oyster Cult. And that's right, that is my vintage 1974 Shigeru Cult E877 Snowdrop Memovox. Donald Roser on vocals and lead guitar at center. Eric Bloom off to the less. Richie Catch... Richie Castellano all the way on far left, Danny Miranda on bass, Jules Rodino on drums. Guys, uh, that was me. My watch was built the same year BOC launched its definitive opus, Secret Treaties. And it was even better, as I say, owning watches and experiencing watches is best as an experience. I was there at the show with our director of watchmaking, Mike Michaels, enjoying a set of 14 classics and a couple of potent potations of the single barrel variety. Guys, thank you for joining me. Send your watch shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. Our October watch winner, I promised you, and here it is, Richard Ortiz of Staten Island, New York, the other island borough. You you are the winner of our Seiko Astron GPS Solar, a $1,600 value from me to you. It will be shipping out with boxes, papers, and warranty shortly. Thank you for joining. We had over 9,000 unique entries. And guess what? Next month, it's the Tudor Black Rose. So get right back into the groove with me next Monday. We're going to be giving away another watch for November. This is going to be another big one. Remember, the fun starts. Tim underscore Masso on Instagram. Join me on my other home on the web when the broadcast ends. Thank you for being a part of my Pixel Party this evening. Thanks to you, thanks to my crew, time out, Tim out, and thanks for logging on.